And next, we have our new Attorney General, Javier Bracera. Uh, the thing I'm going to miss about Javier is the Sunday talk shows. I mean, I, I really, I, I really, there's a big hole there, Javier. But I want to congratulate you on your appointment as Attorney General of the largest state in America, California. Uh, of course, we all know his background. He was in Congress for many, many years and one of the leaders and now has a great job to do as the Attorney General of this state because he's been involved in so many issues and so many things. Now let's welcome our new state Attorney General, Javier Bracera. Javier, come on up. As Judy leads, if I can just say, uh, I, I don't think I or people in the Los Angeles area could be happier and prouder that uh, if we were going to lose a seat on the Ways and Means Committee, to find it filled by Judy Chu is just a remarkable success on the part of California, Southern California, to make sure that we had someone not just capable, but who really fights with a passion for her values. And I think having Judy Chu as our representative on the Ways and Means Committee will return benefits in volumes for quite some time to come. So I hope that we recognize that having Judy Chu on the Ways and Means Committee is just an asset for Southern California. Thank you, Judy. And I actually, um, what was it? Uh, I'm going to follow the sage advice of Thumper. If you can't say, uh, nothing good, then don't say nothing at all about the uh, the first 100 days. I think Judy spoke in many ways about what we confront in Washington, D.C. So let me do this. I, let me start with pop quiz. Pop quiz. Uh, so if, if I may, I'm going to ask a couple quick questions. First, how many of you have kids? Okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Drop your hands if your kids are now adults, or at least they're over 18. They're, okay. How many of you have adolescents? Okay. How many of you have children who are preteen? Okay, okay, good, good. I'm the Attorney General, so I don't have to explain why I asked those questions. <laughs> at, least not, not, at least not yet, at least not yet. <laughs> so let me, let me uh, thank Helen and Tracy for the work that they have done with BizFed and BizFed Institute to just give people a forum to come and talk but to learn. I think it's phenomenal that in Southern California we find ways to team up quickly and do things together. I think that's one of the reasons we've had success not just in Southern California but throughout our state is we come together and we figure out ways to be inclusive and that's so very important in what we do. So. Uh, First 100 days, Donald Trump. Um, I can't make sense of it, and, and to me it's very unpredictable. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to make sense, and I will be unpredictable in what I tell you about the first 100 days of Donald Trump. So I asked you about children. You know, it, it's okay to be to not make sense when you're a child. So obviously you're asking questions and you're trying to learn. And it's okay to be somewhat un unpredictable when you're adolescent. So enjoy yourself at the amusement park as you get on those bumper cars and you're going wild and hitting everybody. Uh, great that you're the fastest kid in that game of dodgeball and dodging all the kids. But at some point, the cars and the bullets are real and it's no longer a game. And we can't afford to have an adolescent with his finger over the nuclear buttons. And so as much as it's no longer a game, sometimes I get the feeling that the current occupant in the White House hasn't stopped campaigning and looking at this as a game. So while he has been trying to push forward an unconstitutional ban on people from entering this country based on religion or national origin. And, in, and at one point it included people who had a right to be here because they had come before and, and been granted legal status by this country and were permanent residents. Um, in California, we fought that. And when he decided to amend that and say, well, we're only going to go after people based on their religion, we still said, read the Constitution. 
the establishment clause doesn't let you do that either. And when he said, well, then I'm going to go ahead and move and in my first 100 days, I'm going to scrap the clean power plan that so many states worked on to try to move us forward so we don't pollute the environment more than we already do. We said no. That was an agreement reached with a whole bunch of people where there are consequences because many of us rely to our detriment on what we agreed to. And so we're challenging that. We challenged the president when he said he was going to scrap the energy efficiency rules that apply to simple things like ceiling fans, light bulbs, because we said no, it works. And there are a whole bunch of businesses and industries throughout our state of California that converted and it would be an unfair disadvantage for them to now have to reconvert to be more polluting so they could compete with those companies that never came forward and were prepared to deal with the need to be cleaner in the way they function. The administration in its first 100 days said it was going to abandon a, a rule that would make sure that people who use prepaid cards don't lose the protections that the federal government said they should have in knowing at least the fees are being charged and how much interest they're going to lose by having purchased a prepaid card. We're challenging the administration for deciding to scrap that rule that was about to take effect. And we're challenging the administration, which just recently said it wants to scrap a rule that would allow those of us who invest, but principally most of those who are older, who invest in retirement savings, knowing that the people that are guiding them in their investments are making decisions that are in their best interest, not in the best interest of the advisor who can make a commission on that investment. And that so-called fiduciary rule was about to take effect on April the 10th, and the administration called for a pullback on that. And so we have said, no, we're going to challenge you on that. And so I can tell you about the White House's first 100 days by telling you what I've been busy doing for the first 100 days of my administration as the Attorney General. Uh, but I think what's important to recognize is that while we have to be prepared to defend the state of California and its people, perhaps what I can tell you that's most important about Donald Trump's first 100 days is that we're not going to worry about Donald Trump's first 100 days because we're going to move forward in what we're doing as a state of California. That's why we went ahead while Donald Tr Trump talked about an infrastructure plan and hasn't done anything to put one forward. California just passed a transfer transportation infrastructure plan worth some $35 billion to make sure our roads, our bridges, our highways are repaired and built so that we can go to work and not spend two hours in traffic. And so we're going to continue to do what we need to do in this state. I've said to people, it's not so much what Donald Trump says that I'm going to concern myself with. It's what he does. And we'll just be ready. And that's what we're going to do. So let me just conclude quickly by saying this. You raise your hand if you had kids. Right, now, one last question. Maybe I'll bring it back to you why I asked your question, the, the question, the pop quiz questions. Um, how many of you have owned or have owned a Subaru? <laughs> All right, Fran, there you go. There, right <laughs> a few folks. I quasi owned one. Uh, my parents had it, they let me borrow it. Okay. So there's, Subaru's got this great commercial. I, I should charge Subaru for this because uh, they have a great commercial right now on TV. I happened to see it when I was on at the airport. It's, uh, it starts off this mother's walking her son out and they're getting ready to get into the Subaru. So you see the photo of the, you know, the pictures of the Subaru right there in front of the driveway. He's clearly going to go uh, camping or something, go visit a friend. He's got a big backpack in his ba uh, on his back. And she goes, oh, hold on. And she pulls out these nunchucks and she says, you're not taking that. And then the next scene is a scene of a little girl standing at the top of the stairs with skis on and her little brother coming down the hallway with skis as well, getting ready, and they're going to go down the stairs in these skis. And the dad says, uh-uh. As, as, as the son's getting out there ready to put on the skis, you're not taking that. And then there's another scene of a little girl walking out with some hair clippers, and she's getting ready to go out to her little sister, a littler sister, 
who's sitting on a little stool with beautiful long hair. And dad says, no, 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 you're not taking that. <laughs> and then there's uh, the one last one that I really like because uh, I grew up with Star Wars. Uh, these kids are taking down the fluorescent light bulbs fr from the light fixture and they're getting ready to play Star Wars <laughs> with their saber swords, right? And, and, and the mom says, no, nah, you're not taking that. And then the final scene is now an adolescent who's in, in the kitchen, and he sort of yells up, Mom, I'm going to take the car out. And he's sort of waiting, and she says, don't be late. <laughs> and, you know, the kick, kicker is, Subaru says, you can't always be there to protect your kids, but we can. And uh, we can't always be there to protect the American people from what we do. We have an election, we respect the election, and we work with the President of the United States because I respect the institution, although I have yet to learn to respect the man, I respect the institution. And so it's very important to know that you can say, don't be late, because at some point we all grow up. Our children become adolescents. The adolescents become adults. I'm waiting for adulthood in this presidency. But because I respect the institutions of our government, because I've learned to believe in America as the first in my family to have a chance to get a college degree and watched my parents work really hard, a construction worker and a clerical worker, and what it means to have a place that, that says, just don't be late. That's what I want to say after the first 100 days of Donald Trump. Don't be late. Don't be late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience at this point? Still no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, we do. We've got some questions. Oh, hold on one second. We've got to get our camera in position. You're going to be all over the internet. Randall Hernandez, VFI board member. So Javier, first of all, thank you very much for being a strong defender of California. We really appreciate all the hard work you've done and you've hit the ground running. But as a, as a congressman, you were always at the forefront of immigration reform. Number one, are there key components of immigration policy now that you would support? And number two, do you think there's opportunity to get some bipartisan work, at least from the California delegation, on some comprehensive, common sense immigration reform? Randall, I, I continue to believe we're gonna get there. I believe we reached the tipping point. My sense is you've seen, you're seeing the, the last gasp effort of a wounded animal who doesn't want to see immigration reform. And, I, and I, there I don't mean Donald Trump is the wounded animal. I mean just the part of this country that is where we were a generation ago with Prop 187. Um, we're going to get there. Uh, California will show the way. We're always about a generation ahead of the, most of the country. And if you think about everything we're doing, whether it's on education, environment, immigration, health care, we're about a generation ahead. They're going to get there. They're going to see the value of inclusivity, of giving people who work hard, like my parents, who were immigrants, a chance to show that you open a door. So I'm very confident. I, you know, when you're the son of immigrants, uh, optimism is in your DNA. And so we're going to get there on that. But I will say this. I just said to you the kicker in that commercial was, the mom saying to the child, don't be late. Right now in a lot of homes, there are a lot of children asking their parents, will you be home tonight? And that, that's a frightening message to have to speak to your parents, not knowing if your mom or dad will come home from work because they're afraid of being picked up by immigration authorities. And that's why we have to make sure we got an adult in the room over there in Washington, DC, because this is no longer bumper cards and dodgeball. This is real stuff, and we have to make it work. We have time for one more question. Oh, we didn't have to travel very far. There you go. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you so much. It's an honor to have you here today. You. I'm Madam Townsend, uh, past chair of BizFed Institute here. Also, I'm um, president and CEO of the Regional Black Chamber, and I set over 35 black chambers around the state, representing a lot of small businesses. Um, I, I think the one of the most important job you do is extraordinary. I just want to know, and perhaps you can share with all of us, 
what is it that we can do, A, as BizFed that represent an amazing amount of people, certainly the black chambers across the state of California with you know thousands of uh, representatives, what is it that we can do simply on, under your direction to help move this agenda even more effectively? That's a great question, and pr probably the best way for me to answer that is to say this. Um, and I said this before, and I say it principally to folks in an audience like this, where I think most of us are successful in business, and and I hope it's understood and, and taken for what it is as a metaphor. Um, I'm not here to help you. And you shouldn't be here to help me, because the reality is, if by now we don't know how to help our, each other and ourselves, we're flukes. We're here because we know how to succeed. It's not we who have to help us. It's we who have to help those like my parents who somehow got a kid who got a, a, accepted a Stanford but had no way to pay. And we came together as taxpayers a generation ago and said, you know what? We're going to give you Pell Grants. We're going to give you work study. We're going to make it possible for you to go to college, to send your kid to college. And guess what? That kid paid dividends because now the kid is not just the attorney general of the state of California. He's got three daughters in private universities where he, he and principally my wife, a doctor, is paying full freight on the tuition <laughs> on those three daughters. And so the best thing I can tell you is this. Know that I've got your back because I want you to succeed. I have a feeling you'll have my back because you want to continue to see California become not just the sixth economic power in the world, but maybe the fifth or the fourth. And if we do that, and if we're doing that for each other, without really thinking about trying to help each other, we're helping my mom and my dad. And they become part of that middle class. We'll do what World War II America did for the veterans when they came back. We said, you're gonna be, GI you were GIs, so you're gonna have a GI Bill of Rights, and we're gonna give you college education. And they rewarded us by creating the largest middle class, which rewarded you, and you and you and your companies, because they could buy anything you made. That's what we wanna do. And I understand that the potential future governor of the state of California is here, so I'm going to let Antonio Villarregosa go next. Thank you very much.